welcome to the Leading with Lean podcast. My name is Philip Holt, author of Leading with Lean, The Simplicity of Lean, and Leading Lean by Living Lean. And in this podcast, I narrate all three of my books, chapter by chapter, in which I share with you my over 30 years of experience as a lean leader across many companies globally. Leading with Lean, Chapter 10, Learning from Success, The Kaikaku Experience. The word Kaizen is part of the vocabulary of most people in modern business, and I would certainly expect the readership of this book to be very familiar with its meaning, literally a change for good. And with the Kaizen culture of lean enterprises that the vast majority of organisations attempt to emulate. A closely related term in the Japanese lean lexicon is Kaikaku, which literally translated means radical change and is the part of improvement where changes are made to the business that would not be achieved through the smaller incremental steps of Kaizen. Neither Kaizen or Kaikaku are better than the other and, in fact, both are required if we are to be successful in our transformation, building a Kaizen culture whereby every member of our organisation makes sustainable improvement every day, Kaizen whilst highly effective project teams and Kaizen event teams create step change improvement on a less frequent but still regular basis, Kaikaku. These complementary approaches are absolutely essential if we are to see our enterprise reach its target and must be embraced in the lean transformation. And in the book, what you'll see is a very simple chart which shows Kaizen making slight improvements up the performance uh, continuum but Kaikaku making step changes, but both connected so that we get a gradual improvement through Kaizen, step change through Kaikaku, continued um, improvement through Kaizen, step change through Kaikaku, and so on throughout time. This concept of Kaikaku must also be applied to learning from success, as we need to get out there and set our vision for the future, our Kaikaku vision. And to do this, we need to go and see, go to Gemba, other companies who are significantly ahead of us in terms of their lean transformation. This doesn't need to be those organisations that are truly at the level of a lean enterprise, such as Toyota, but can be organisations who are a few years ahead of our lean transformation. The general rule is that you must see things there that both simultaneously excite and scare you, as they are both highly appealing as a vision of what you want to achieve and realistic to envision, but at the same time, you have a certain fear of the challenges ahead to achieve it. In my own experience, I recall visiting companies such as Rico, Omran, and Parker Hannafin, where they had effective pull systems supported by great daily management and problem solving and an enviable Kaizen culture. These visual factories seem light years ahead of the Philips consumer lifestyle factories where I was responsible for the lean deployment. However, as a leadership team, we took inspiration from those visits and many others and grasped the challenge that they presented. Fast forward to when I wrote this book and every one of those consumer lifestyle factories had reached a level comparable to those that we'd visited about seven years before that, with two of them having won world-class manufacturing awards. They are all now regularly visited by external parties who want to experience a Kaikaku vision themselves. It's therefore an essential part of setting the vision that the leadership visits other organisations that will both inspire and challenge them to make significant change during their own lean transformation. If not, the risk is that the goals of the transformation will be simply too modest, as they are potentially stuck in unconscious incompetence. They don't know what they don't know, as discussed in Chapter 4 and are unable to picture a future significantly different from their current state. It's not industrial tourism. The visiting of these enterprises to gain the vision of excellence is often called the Kaikaku experience, and an important element of the experience is that it should not become industrial tourism, but must be a true opportunity for the leadership to experience what their future could look like. To achieve this, the lean leader must follow some basic but important rules when designing the Kaikaku experience for their leadership team. Number one, preparation. The lean leader must ensure that they create a network of external contacts across a number of organisations based upon a mixture of the industry that they're in, the areas of the business in which they are deploying lean, and the maturity of their lean transformation. In some cases, these relationships will be established on a transactional basis, whereby access to Go-See is a commercial arrangement, as can be found with Toyota and other larger organisations with world-class credentials. 
Similarly, there are several consultancies who can organise the Kaikaku experiences in most parts of the world, and there are many who will take you, for a price, to the source and the ultimate opportunity to go see the Japanese Kaikaku experience. These types of commercial arrangement can be extremely useful, but with the caveat that the lean leader must still do due diligence and ensure that the visits will be suitable for their organisation's leadership team to see what they need for inspiration and challenge. This does not mean that they should only look for companies that do exactly the same as they do, but it does mean that the businesses to be visited will have elements of a business system that could address some of the biggest problems facing their company. Whilst transactional arrangements can be useful for arranging Kaikaku experiences, building mutually beneficial relationships with other organisations can be equally fruitful. The difficulty with this is that you want to visit organisations that are more advanced than yours in their lean transformation, and therefore the quid pro quo becomes more challenging. What can you offer them in return for their time and effort in hosting you? In some cases, you may each have elements of your transformation that are better than the others. For example, you may have a great learning academy in place, while they've done more in terms of instigating daily management and problem solving. In other cases, it could be that you've got something else to offer, such as providing them with facilities to use for meetings and workshops, or maybe your marketing director is an expert in online marketing and can spend some time speaking to their marketing team. You may find that some companies simply value your external view and ability to provide them with some independent feedback. This has been one element that my colleagues and I have used, especially as we have developed a network of visited companies and can provide subjective feedback to those that we visit, while of course respecting the confidentiality of those companies that we have previously visited. The lean leader will get to know the potential Kaikaku experience organisations very well and understand how they can be best utilised overall for their own organisation's learning, but also specifically for different parts of their organisation. For example, for the new product development, marketing or manufacturing teams. They will maintain a catalogue of the enterprises and will design the Kaikaku experiences as much as possible around the match between the participants' learning needs and the available plethora of companies. The obvious caveat here is that there is a finite number of times that each company may be visited, especially where the relationship is based on contact and mutual learning as opposed to commercial interchange. Additionally, for a global organisation, there will be geographical, cultural and language challenges to manage. This means that the lean leader must build as large a database as possible to ensure that the Kaikaku experience needs of the organisation may be met over time. Number two, facilitation. To facilitate the visits in the right spirit, it's essential that the lean leader creates something that is truly an experience. A typical Kaikaku experience will include visits to between two and four companies, with three being an effective number for learning. These companies will all demonstrate something a little different for the participants and could be a mix of manufacturing and knowledge companies. One such trip that we previously used was Toyota, Car Assembly, Recall, Printing Machines and Virgin Money, Credit Card Management. The visited companies should be as geographically close as possible to allow for a tour that is not overly burdened by travel and allows the travel to be arranged in a way that will build the team's experience, such as hiring a motor coach to take the team together. The team visit will then be focused on attending the Kaikaku experience together and having a shared learning experience. The participants will receive a Kaikaku experience brochure ahead of the visit, which will explain the objectives of the visit the background of the companies to be visited and the learning expectations per company. This document will have been well researched by the lean leader as part of the preparation for the Kaikaku tour. During the tour, the lean leader will facilitate the group as their coach and will assign learning tasks to the members to ensure that the visits have real meaning, with the objectives understood by the participants and fulfilled. To do this, the lean leader will follow an agenda that ensures that the tour is effective. Number one. Take one day per company visit to avoid being rushed. Number two, manage travel time to allow at least four hours at each company, ensuring sufficient time to learn. Number three, incorporate a briefing and debriefing per visit to ensure that the participants are preferred before visiting and reflect and capture their learning immediately afterwards. An example of a typical visit agenda for one company would therefore be eight o'clock in the morning, breakfast briefing, an overview of the company to be visited, a reminder of the visit etiquette, confirmation of the team learning objectives, assignment of the learning focus for each team member. Nine o'clock, arrive at company X, 
registration and safety briefing. 9.30, introductions to host, sharing of visit objectives by both parties. 10 o'clock, go to Gemba, part one. 12 o'clock, working lunch, general discussions with the hosts. 12.45, go to Gemba, part two. 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Q&A session, wrap up, thank you to the hosts, including a gift within company policy and farewells. 3 o'clock, end of visit. 3.30, debriefing session, reflections of the visit, capture of the general and team member specific learning, determining the immediate knowledge transfers for their own in deployment. 5 o'clock, end of day and travel. An important part of the visit etiquette is the maintenance of the mindset around learning and not criticising. While it is valid to ask questions for clarification, especially where a particular approach has been used and it is unclear to a participant why it was done that way, the intent must be to learn and not to try to prove that the hosts are not doing it well enough. Depending on how the visit is progressing and the relationship built between the lean leader and the host company's people, the host may ask for feedback and be open to advice or criticism. However, they should always be given in good faith and with the intent of shared learning and discovery. Nothing will irrevocably damage the relationship between the continuous improvement teams of two companies faster than the feeling that one of the parties is trying to prove a superiority of knowledge. Instead, the best advice that I can ever give to the participants of a Kaikaku experience, or to be honest, most visits to other enterprises, is to be consistently looking for great ideas to learn from and utilising their own organisation, what I jokingly refer to as proudly stealing. The third element is post-visit. After the visit, the participants, the leadership of the particular areas of the business beginning their lean transformation, will spend further time determining how the learning from the Kakaku experience may be best incorporated into their organisation. They will have seen and experienced much and, whilst a cut and paste approach is often not possible, there should be a great deal of inspiration for improvements in the ways of working, and these must be grasped with both hands. The lean leader again plays a key role in this part of the process, ensuring that the follow-up happens and that the learning is translated into tangible activity. Where ideas cannot yet be adopted, possibly due to it being simply too early, they should be properly captured for posterity and regularly reviewed. Hi, Philip here. Sorry to interrupt the narration of this particular chapter, but I just wanted to remind you that all of my personal profits from the books go to charity. And so if you would like to buy a book, it would really be helpful. Otherwise, if you feel that the podcast is sufficient, then please feel free to make a donation to my current charity, which is Women's Aid. It's a great charity which helps to stop domestic violence for women and children. Thank you. The model line is the internal Kaikaku experience. In the early days of the lean deployment, external parties will need to be used for the Kaikaku experiences, simply because the organisation will not have any areas of its own to showcase. However, as its transformation progresses, model lines will be created, which can become internal Kaikaku sites, and their use should be encouraged. However, just as with the external sites, they must be used with meaning and industrial tourism avoided. Especially in the early days, when there are only a few of them, they will be in high demand and it is therefore essential that visits are managed by the lean leader and the model line leadership to avoid overload. The model lines must therefore be managed as part of the Kaikaku experience database and planning process. The use of external companies should be ongoing even when the transformation is at a high level of maturity as external benchmarking and learning must be continual. In fact, probably the best way to utilise the internal sites is as one of the Kaikaku experience visit locations and therefore the visits become a mixture of both internal and external organisations. One of the biggest advantages of having internal models of excellence is the ease with which others in the organisation will accept that lean will work for them, as it is much more difficult to say, yes, I see that works for Virgin, Toyota and Honeywell, but we don't provide credit cards, make cars or instrument clusters when the organisation is doing the same thing. Another key advantage of having internal Kaikaku sites is that host people work for use the same company and speak the same business language, work in the same or a very similar culture, face similar problems and have common high level goals. This makes it much easier for the participants of the visit and the host to create the connections that support effective communication and enable successful knowledge transfer. 
If these physical visits can be augmented and replicated virtually through the use of internal social media sites, webcasts, videos and newsletters, this knowledge sharing and replication can be scaled up and the viral effect created. Discussed further in Mosquito Leadership in Chapter 11. This will affect, infect the organisation with good ideas. However, to do so, the lean leader must tackle the syndrome of not invented here effectively. Not invented here syndrome. Not invented here syndrome is one of the biggest disablers of effective learning and knowledge transfer that exists. It's a natural human attitude to resist the idea that someone else's way of working could be better than one's own and will result, at best, in a reinvention of the wheel and, at worst, in completely missing the opportunity to adopt best practice. In the best case scenario, the team will essentially adopt the idea, but instead of taking it and adapting it to work in their organisation, they will completely re-engineer it, including rewriting standard work instructions in their own parlance. To some extent, this can be part of the change management process as the team internalise and make the idea their own, which can help with ownership and the sustainability of the approach. However, this must be kept to a minimum if the organisation has become a learning organisation and rapidly adopt new ways of working without excessive time spent in implementation. In the worst case scenario, the team rejects best practices as inappropriate for their organisation and creates a form of organisational allergy to outside influences. This is a change management issue as it is deeply rooted in the fear of change and must be overcome if the organisation is to take advantage of the many best practices that exist outside their immediate domain. As discussed in Chapter 3, there are some important change leadership tactics that must be employed, described by Cotter's eight steps of change leadership. The lean deployment approach must ensure that the team members start to address some of the key fears of change and learn to see the advantages for them, answering the question, what's in it for me that is critical to gaining their engagement in the transformation? The not invented here mindset is not always obvious and its symptoms can manifest themselves as perceived stubbornness or incompetence as the team fails to reap the benefits that were observed in the Kaikaku organisation. However, the lean thinking leader understands that nothing is as simple as it appears at face value and will take the time to understand why intelligent and experienced team members are failing to gain the benefits so seemingly obvious to everyone else. It's only when this understanding is applied that this significant barrier may be removed. Scale, scale, scale. Whenever the best practices are discovered or developed, either internally or externally, it is critical that they are scaled as quickly as possible to gain the coverage across the organisation that we need. As discussed in the previous section, avoiding not invented here syndrome requires careful change leadership, and so scaling cannot be done in a mechanical fashion. As Peter Senge famously said, people don't resist change, they resist being changed. It is therefore crucial that the lean leader attains balance between the speed of scaling through a cut and paste technique, convincing the team members to adopt the ideas by giving them ownership of the approach. This is one of the key elements of the viral model discussed in Chapter 5, whereby the replication stage takes those best practices, the new standard work, and replicates them across the whole organisation. This approach to replication ensures that the model lines created in stage two have adopted as many external best practices as possible and have effectively implemented the Kaikaku as well as Kaizen improvements. This ensures that the replication across the organisation can take place with the reassurance for the receiving teams that these ways of working are applicable to their organisation and are not just external best practices being imposed upon them dogmatically. This doesn't remove the necessity for the receiving team to adopt the new ways of working through a process that earns their ownership. It does, however, reduce the reinvention as the why and what of the methodology should be clear and the time invested goes on the how. As the whole organisation gains experience in effective learning, it will become a core competency and a continuous part of the team's modus operandi. This must be supported with a knowledge management system that enables rapid and effective knowledge sharing amongst the teams particularly those that are geographically dispersed, and a Kaizen system that allows rapid improvements in a culture of continuous improvement while still protecting the standardisation required across all team members undertaking the same activity. This means that the problem of who approves Kaizen and when they can be implemented needs to be solved, and in Chapter 17 I will discuss how to reconcile the local 
and value stream approach, which can cause this to be a challenge. Whilst the pursuit of perfection is essential to the lean leader, not yet having the perfect knowledge management and Kaizen systems in place should not be a barrier to replication and scale up. The environment you will have come from will most likely be one that had a lack of adherence to standard work and infrequent improvement. And so the tension created by having imperfect Kaizen and knowledge management systems is a small price to pay for the improvement in ways of working. Thank you.